Welcome, good evening, and welcome to the Allegheny Health Network and Orthopedics This Week CME August course. Today, we are covering the topic of robot-assisted surgery and artificial intelligence in the OR. Good evening. My name is Boyle Chang. I'm the Director of Research for the Neuroscience Institute here at the Allegheny Health Network. I'm excited to talk tonight a little bit about robotic technology and the impact it's had on training programs. I wanted to thank my co-authors, Drs. Kyle Holmberg and Dan Altman. As we start, AGH has built a specific facility here called Center for the Surgical Arts. It's really a bioskills facility and we're quite proud of it but really it's designed for the students. It's designed for residents. It's designed for attendees. This 21 station facility hosts some of the most modern equipment that was available at the time of construction. Uh, and, and you can see a picture of it here in the lower left hand, but it's really designed around the premise that we can facilitate the old mantra, see one, do one, teach one. This is critical, particularly for residency programs having the opportunity to really jump on a uh, practice facility, a trainer, if you will, for their surgical skills. In the upper right hand, you can see pictures of a resident uh, going through the steps and the techniques with a group of CMU students. It's exciting for them to learn, but it's also important for a resident to to be able to practice these procedures and to be able to explain exactly what he's doing. It makes for a great collaboration. In the lower right hand, we see Dr. Sauber teaching a group of CMU students and telling him his experience, sharing with them what it takes to do a, a MAKO-assisted uh, unicondylar knee, what it takes to incorporate that into the OR. So in this facility, we've really invested in into the resident training program, really invested in these students and their educational experience. And this is a facility, by the way, that is open to everyone. Going back to Carnegie Mellon University, this medical devices course that I teach, it's important to understand why we design the devices the way that we do. And we talk about very clear objectives. The first objectives that we teach uh, the first objective is making sure that they understand that there's heavy emphasis on anatomy, physiology, and the pathology associated with that anatomy. This brings about a clinical relevance to device design. The second objective that we teach is that specific parameters should include things like materials, and materials considerations are often at uh, first and foremost and making sure that we have the appropriate material to sustain the necessary parameters to design inputs, if you will, for the device design itself. And there's also careful consideration for challenges and other things that may not be necessarily or readily apparent. The third objective that we go into is starts off with failure. We, we teach that failure is not uncommon, and there's a number of very relevant, very important case studies uh, throughout the not only that medical device textbook that we teach from, but through our own personal experiences, we can share a lot about what we know about failure. Failure is also incumbent, a main driving factor for us to collect as much data as possible. Not only does it justify a lot of the lab testing that goes on, but it gives us a fundamental understanding of why these things may fail. And through failure analysis, retrospectively, we can look back and see why we did not meet the specific goal and certainly understand that failure a little bit more clear the more data that we have. One of the more important and interesting aspects of data collection is that you will continually see an increased importance and emphasis on patient reported outcomes. And we think that is critical to the success and understanding of these medical devices. Exciting area for us within the Neuroscience Institute is specific the area of neuromodulation. In this category, we see that there has been tremendous stride made in the imaging aspect. 
not only has the imaging been instrumental, but we also know that navigation has benefited from increased imaging capability. That in combination with a lot of the lead technology, the IPG technology, really has broadened the area of neuromodulation. But it's a clear example of how imaging and specifically navigation have benefited this type of technology. The important device design that we teach is that imaging should be an important design element. A material selection can have a major impact on the imaging capability. Regulatory risk and failure analysis are all the are also important consideration, important design elements in the medical device design, as we all know. Um, and then, of course, when it comes to the device itself, we teach, of course, specifically that the anatomy is an important consideration, along with the physiology, pathology, and the patient outcomes and legal liability. Cardiovascular is another application um, that has benefited directly from imaging improvements. The technology that is associated with imaging, the navigation technology, and now the robot assisted technology certainly has benefited and has been uh, uh, applied in areas like cardiovascular application. When we see what they do in, with heart valves, when we see that stent placement and all these other robot assisted procedures that have uh, been introduced into the cardiovascular space, it is very encouraging to see that technology has certainly capitalized on the skills of the surgeon and also added, when we look at the patient performance, we see that the added benefit from these robot assisted procedure. But it starts with anatomy, as we all well know. In medicine, it's incumbent upon every med student, every resident, and obviously every attending to have a firm grasp of that anatomy. Going back to the bioskill facility, majority of that time is spent in understanding the anatomy itself. This is where traditional instruments have really helped. When we look at technology like fluoroscopy and the C arms that are continuously in use in the ORs, we see that they are still fundamental in understanding particularly the two-dimensional aspects of the anatomy. That planar configuration, the planar geometry, and the anatomy itself go hand in hand. When we start to look at more complex imaging set, when we start to look at the solid models created from three-dimensional image data sets, we see how that technology has really brought about new capabilities and new insight, if you will, into anatomy, but also how it has improved in surgical technique itself. One clear-cut example has been in the specific orthopedic space. And when we look at unicondylar knees, we see that it has benefited specifically from the technology that we'll be talking about today. When we look at unicondylar knees prior to robot-assisted procedure, we see that it was a very technically demanding surgical procedure. When we look at the anatomy and when we look at how surgeons were implanting these devices. A lot of it was done freehand. There were certainly instruments, there were tools designed to support the procedure, but they were often cumbersome and, and, and a little bit awkward. When we see Mako and one of the first application of the Mako robot, we see how that has benefited specifically that procedure itself. The MAKO technology really brought about a robot assisted procedure for unicondylar knees that didn't have a lot of the pitfalls uh, and, and, and the clumsiness associated with either freehand or a lot of the instrumentation designed to support uh, robot procedure, I'm sorry, that were uh, uh, cumbersome in, in the instrumentation designed to support unicondylar knees. This is an example of the robot uh, and also the implant itself. And in the upper right hand, you see a patient implanted. That technology has since been applied to other orthopedic applications. We know that uh, the MAKO uh, is certainly 
will help in total knee replacement as well as applications now in hip. And so large joint reconstruction has certainly not only benefited from better imaging capability, but better navigation technology. And ultimately we see that as robot assisted procedures become prevalent, the important consideration that it is that it builds on the fundamental surgical data set that was trained within all of our residents. So it's important to take technology into consideration. And this is also a very important quote. Without data, you're just another person with an opinion. And this was postulated by Edward Deming, known for total quality system. Still a very important consideration today and something that I would love to leave as food for thought. As bioskills are being developed, as we look at these technologies that are being introduced into the OR, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure that the skills necessary to perform these surgical procedures are still at the core of the training programs and these technologies only augment the existing skills necessary to complete those procedures. We say that because that as these students graduate, as they matriculate, as they establish their own practices, they're going to rely on their fundamental skill set for orthopedic surgeons, for neuro uh, 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 surgeons. It's important that we understand that training uh, is upon all of us that these fundamental skills are still being taught and technology contributes to their skill set. So with that, I'm excited to turn it over to the rest of the presentation tonight. I'm excited to hear their thoughts on technology and how that should be incorporated, not only into practice, but hopefully there's consideration for the training programs as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, from Columbia University Irving Medical Center, we have Dr. Z Shan Sardar. He specializes in minimally invasive surgical techniques for spinal deformities and degenerative disease. His topic will cover freehand surgery, robot assisted procedures, and how and why they coexist. Dr. Sardar, thanks for being here. Thank you, Boyle, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present uh, in this session. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about freehand pedicles replacement the relevance of this in the era of robotics, navigation, and augmented reality. Uh, my name is Zishan Sadar. I'm a spine surgeon uh, and an assistant professor at Columbia University and the Ox Spine Hospital at New York Presbyterian. Here are my disclosures. So I'm going to be talking about why freehand pedicle screws are still relevant in, in today's age. And before I start talking about it, I thought it would be relevant to talk about my background, uh, just so the audience has an idea of where I'm coming from. Uh, and so I trained with freehand pedicle screws in my residency in orthopedic surgery. During my fellowships, uh, which were three of them lasted two years, uh, I did a combination of uh, pedicle screws uh, in terms of freehand, freehand with assistance with fluoroscopy, uh, screws using navigation, and then screws using robotics. And when I first started practice, I only did uh, freehand screws for about the first two and a half years. Uh, part of it was because we didn't have access to any of the uh, major assistive technologies where I started practice. Uh, gradually, as I transitioned and, and joined Columbia, uh, I also transitioned to using the uh, robotics technology more frequently for pedicle screw placement. So currently, the majority of the screws that I place are with uh, robotic assistance for my elective cases. Occasionally, I'll use navigation for cervical spine, and I do primarily a freehand pedicle screw placements for pediatrics and for young adults uh, to minimize radiation. And then finally, I will use a freehand pedicle screw placement for emergency cases and, and for patients that are less medically stable. Uh, and we'll go over why that is. And so what is a freehand pedicle screw placement? Well, this is when you place pedicle screws without using any of the various assistive technologies. Uh, it requires an intimate knowledge of normal anatomical landmarks and anatomy of the patient. And as you can see on the pictures on the right-hand side, this is a paper uh, uh, 
from Dr. Lenke's group uh, in 2004, uh, which uh, details different landmarks used for each uh, level of the thoracic spine for particle screw placement. And there have been uh, many other techniques described to place particle screws uh, freehand. Uh, this is just one of them. I won't go into the details of this, uh, but some of the tips that I've learned uh, over the years in terms of uh, uh, using the freehand techniques uh, is that even if you understand what a typical anatomy of the patient of a patient is supposed to be, uh, you still want to really uh, uh, perform a detailed evaluation of their x-rays, MRI scans, and CT scans if available to understand the specific patient's anatomy and their variation from, from so-called normal. Uh, because even though we have the typical anatomy that we learn for screw placement, there is always variation as we, as we see in every single case. Some have more variation than the others. It's, it's important to understand uh, the location of uh, structures at risk when you're doing screw placement, such as the spinal cord, uh, the spinal nerves, and then obviously the uh, major vessels that are close to us as we're working uh, and putting these screws in. Uh, and what I've learned is that in difficult cases when you're still having a, a hard time uh, placing a particle screw or, or, or determining where the location is, you can use the laminotomy to find where the particle is and then uh, place the pedicle screw. And so here is an example of what I mean by detailed evaluation of, of X-rays and MRI. And, and this is, again, uh, brief just to get the point across. Is if you look on the right-hand side, this uh, X-ray of a patient with idiopathic scoliosis, you can get an idea that uh, not all pedicles, number one, are of the same size, even at the same level. Uh, as we know, uh, pedicles on the concavity are typically much smaller than the pedicles here on the, concav on the convexity. Uh, and then there is a difference in terms of rotation of the pedicles as you go from top to bottom. And so those are all important things you want to look at in x-ray to really determine how you want to place your freehand pedicle screws here. It shows the location of pedicles at the same segment, showing the difference in size. And then on the MRI scans, I will still, uh, again, look at the size of the pedicles, uh, as you can see in this uh, blue eye outline, which is uh, a pedicle at the uh, concavity. A uh, small particle, so it's important to know these variations. You can also see the spinal cord here is quite close to this small uh, concave particle. So it does put the spinal cord at a higher risk as opposed to the particle on the other side, uh, which we can, which we don't have here. Uh, but the, that other particle on the convexity is quite far away from the thoracic spinal cord and makes it a safer particle. And then finally, uh, as you're placing these screws, we need to be aware of where the major vessels are. So these are all the things, you know, and a lot more that we look at uh, on each specific patient's anatomy to really get an intimate understanding of the specific patient's anatomy, and not just knowing in general terms, you know, where the starting points and pedicle screws uh, go. Because especially for deformity cases, people have a lot of variation. Uh, a technique that's very commonly used uh, with freehand is the use of fluoroscopy in addition. Uh, or to augment and facilitate placement of these screws. Uh, and again, this is quite commonly used, I think, across the United States. Uh, it is associated with an increase in uh, operating time as well as radiation exposure to the surgeon and patient. But it can help with uh, cases where you have difficult anatomy, the origin cases where there isn't much of a, a reference in terms of anatomy, and patients where there is a lot of rotational deformity. Uh, you do need at least a true AP for each segment as you try to um, cannulate each of these segments. And again, this paper by Bai uh, shows a good overview of uh, what landmarks you're looking at. Uh, so again, so freehand is not just necessarily freehand. You can use fluoroscopy uh, to assist with freehand pedicle screws. And then the third and a very important technique to use to that can be used with freehand pedicle screws is the use of 3D printed models. And this is especially uh, useful in cases with severe deformity, as you can see in this patient that I'm showing. I have a 3D printed model of this patient, and I've marked out uh, pedicle starting point for this specific patient. Uh, and, and I can also then you know, uh, take this model with me to the operating room and use it as a reference as I perform surgery uh, so that I know exactly where each pedicle screw is and I can basically use this as a, as a cheat for these complex cases to place freehand pedicle screws. 
So yeah, in summary, those are three main, main ways of putting spherical screws in. Uh, we have the freehand technique. So let's come to the second point. Uh, why use freehand versus using assistive technology? And I'm not going to de debate the role of navigation and robotics. Uh, I think uh, these, all these assistive technologies do have a very definite and proven role now in spine surgery. Uh, and myself, as I said, I use robotics and navigation quite frequently. Uh, we do have uh, several studies that have demonstrated equivalent or better accuracy of screw placement with these technologies, uh, lesser proximal facet joint violations, and at least equivalent uh, clinical outcomes. Uh, so there is a definite benefit in using these technologies. It does come at a cost. Many of these equipments are expensive. Uh, they do expose the patient to more radiation due to the need for CT scans, and they do end up uh, increasing the surgical time and duration for the patient. So uh, knowing these benefits and some of the uh, uh, costs associated with assistive technology, there are times when freehand screws may need to be placed. And so I'll go over some of those scenarios uh, which still make uh, freehand screw placement relevant. Um, even if you have access to these assistive technologies. And so here is a case uh, of a 57-year female who had difficulty standing upright uh, that I did uh, a surgery on. And the initial plan was to use uh, robotic, uh, assistant, robotic assistance in this case. Uh, but infrequently, now this doesn't happen very commonly. I think this probably happened to me once or twice in the past uh, three years, uh, that the robot is unable to uh, register or, or segment things appropriately, and you just can't and you can't use the robot. And so in this case, obviously, what do you do at that point when you have the patient exposed? Uh, you're all ready to start placing your screws in, but now the robot doesn't work. And so this is a case where I ended up then uh, using the freehand uh, technique to place screws in with uh, again good placement and, and eventually good correction of the patient's deformity. So. Uh, you know, this this is this is imp really important that even if you have all these technologies, you still need to be able to place screws using the freehand method. Well, when else would we use freehand? Well, you know, when time is of the essence. So uh, I had a recently an 88 year old female with a severe spinal cord compression from a T10 pathologic fracture causing uh, severe lower extremity weakness. She had multiple medical comorbidities, and essentially, as soon as we exposed uh, the spine, she had EKG changes and had difficulty maintaining her blood pressure. So we really needed to speed up and rush in this case. And so as we know, using robotics in these type of situations, while it's accurate, it does add more time. Uh, here are some CT scans of the patient's uh, pathology. You can see a compression fracture at T10 and essentially a blockage of CSF flow at that level as well. And so because of this patient being old, multiple comorbidities, as well as uh, EKG changes, essentially from the uh, exposure time, uh, I decided not to use the robot and decided to proceed with freehand screw placement so that we can complete this surgery really fast. And we were able to finish this skin to skin in an hour and 30 minutes, uh, including post-respinal instrumentation and fusion from T8 to T12 a decompression T9 to T11, and a left T10 pedicle uh, resection and ventral decompression. So these are the times where I would avoid using um, uh, assistive technology. Uh, I also preferred not to use uh, robotics or navigation in young patients, in young uh, adults or in adolescent patients, where, where it's important to limit radiation to these patients. So this is a case of a 13-year-old female with uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. And I typically will not uh, send these patients for a CT scan that is needed for the assistive technology. And so again, we ended up doing a freehand screw placement uh, for this patient without any problem. But what happens when you work at a place without a robot or navigation? And so this is what happened to me for the first about two and a half or so years of my practice. I was at a place where we did not have navigation, we did not have robotics. So, uh, and, and this will be true for many uh, fellows and residents as they uh, leave their major academic institutes and, and go to smaller uh, private practices or community hospitals where they may not have access to all the technologies. And that's where you are going to have to rely on freehand uh, screw placement techniques to be able to perform these surgeries. And so that's what I did here. A patient with a previous syringe rod, 
uh, we did freehand screw placement again. Uh, everything went well, no problem. Um, and this is an extreme case, it's a case of an extreme deformity where even if you have access to uh, all these major assistive technologies, sometimes they don't work because of the severe deformity uh, and of this, because of severe rotation. And so this case, I actually started off with using the robot, uh, but the robot wasn't able to really segment the, the different uh, vertebrae properly. And so we had to resort to using freehand. And these are the type of cases where I do take a 3D printed model with me to the operating room in case other technologies don't work and I have to rely on freehand and on, on uh, intimate knowledge of the anatomy in a patient who has extremely distorted anatomy to begin with. Uh, so this is pre-op versus post-op. And finally, the point I want to make is that it's even if you have technology, it's important to know when this technology may be off. And what I mean by that is, is uh, if you see a spine and the robot or the navigation is telling you to place a screw at this blue mark, you should be able to figure out from your uh, freehand placement knowledge that this is not the right place to place the screws. And this can avoid uh, you getting in trouble even if uh, everything seemingly uh, looks okay. Uh, so this is, again, this doesn't happen frequently, but one in 100 cases you may see this and you may be able to avoid this disaster uh, from happening if you, if you know how to place freehand uh, pedicle screws. Uh, and then, you know, lastly, the thing that everyone wants to know and wants to talk about is what is the impact on training? And there is definitely going to be and is an impact on training uh, at institutions where uh, freehand particle screws are not used. And there are many studies that have shown that freehand particle screw accuracy is correlated with the experience of a surgeon. Uh, and you know, so you can, uh, you can uh, extrapolate that if trainees have less exposure to freehand screw placements to begin with, they're going to not be very competent in placing these screws by the time they finish residency or fellowship. Uh, and, it, and it could lead to case abandonment when, when these technologies don't work uh, in real life. So you know, there are a lot of reasons uh, to know how to place freehand pedicle screws, even in today's day where we have access now to robotics and navigation and, and virtual reality or augmented reality. So I think it's still critical uh, uh, this technology is great and it will continue to improve and uh, it'll probably be less and less often that we'll have to use the freehand particle screws, uh, but you still need to know how to place them for those few cases where other things may not work. It will, it will save you on the day when, when technology malfunctions. Uh, and like I said, you know, knowing the landmarks will help prevent misplaced screws from happening because you can get that visual confirmation uh, from your knowledge of anatomy. And sometimes it is faster to just place screws freehand, uh, which which may be a consideration in, in patients who are sick. And I'll stop at this point. Thank you very much for uh, joining and for listening. And I will uh, take any questions at this point. Thank you, Zishan, for sharing those points with us. Our next presenter is Dr. Mark Barber, physician with Alabama Orthopedic Clinic. He will be speaking on the work he has been doing with InHatch. Thank you. Uh, I'm Matt Barber from Alabama Orthopedic Clinic in Mobile, Alabama. And our topic today is emerging technology in orthopedic surgery, specifically artificial intelligence, but touching a little bit on augmented reality, robotics, and some other technologies. Obviously, each one of these is a huge, uh, very broad area that can be discussed, that can be parsed down into different segments. But we're going to take sort of a big overview of that, of the potential associated with artificial intelligence and augmented reality and robotics and patient-specific instrumentation and look at where some of these are and how that they might fit into a concept of intelligent surgery. So artificial intelligence essentially hopes to harness the power of uh, the computational power of AI, uh, the machine learning associated with that to potentially enhance implant design, uh, make some of our reconstructive procedures more anatomic, uh, may have the possibility to accelerate surgery, make us more efficient, 
We're dealing with uh, a huge aging population, having a lot of uh, arthroplasty procedures, a lot of spinal procedures, and needing to do these well and do them at scale is something that AI uh, may be of use for. And most of all, we want to improve patient outcomes. Uh, if all of this technology is not empathetic to the outcomes of our patients and the experience of our patients, uh, it's not going to contribute much to what we're doing. So we think about this ecosystem, if you will, of intelligent surgery, and that may be where AI has some of its greatest use. So can we use AI throughout the enterprise through every part associated with the surgery to uh, improve our expertise, to improve our clinical workflow, and make things faster, safer, and smarter. Um, the most important things here are patient safety and patient outcomes. Uh, patient safety trumps everything. So we want to look at processes uh, that integrate into uh, workflow for efficiency, uh, but also for accuracy. Uh, do patient-specific guides, robotics, and other technologies um, do that? Do they make things actually better? Um, I think there is, is sort of the palpable sense with any of these technologies that if we're just adding on expensive doodads to every surgery, we're increasing cost and we may not be increasing quality. But if we're using these intelligently, if we're using or harnessing the power of artificial intelligence to examine our outcomes and to look at what's really going on, then we can decide which technologies we need, which are important, which are the best. Uh, a lot of us, I think, believe uh, that surgery and that the, the care of our patients uh, is not at its best when nothing more can be added but maybe it's at its best when nothing else can be taken away. When we've really used an intelligent environment to strip this down to its most important parts. So in this slide, you see um, really a, a graphic of what an intelligent surgery ecosystem might look like. You have things that start at the pre-surgical level with segmentation, the ability to plan preoperatively and to collaborate. So that's collaboration of surgeons with engineers. Uh, for uh, surgeons, it's maybe accuracy with implant sizing, with implant placement uh, that's associated with um, three-dimensional imaging or at least with a three-dimensional reconstruction. Uh, for implant companies, uh, knowing sizing uh, gives them a visibility on what the demand for their implants is. That informs the level of manufacturing that they undertake with a particular size of implants. So it's economically um, viable and productive for them uh, to embrace some of these kind of technologies. So then we're again using these newer technologies like additives manufacturing um, to uh, deliver patient-specific guides, patient-specific implants sometimes um, to get ready for this surgery. And that artificial intelligence has the potential to look at the logistics of this and to analyze the supply chain. In the OR at the implant stage that you see on the bottom right, um, you have uh, potential for training of uh, surgeons uh, that can be uh, for residents, fellows, people in training, to uh, training by industry for specific procedures, specific implants. You have patient-specific uh, guides, patient-specific implants, and uh, increasingly, uh, we're starting to see some augmented reality uh, in the OR to actually give a uh, heads-up display to the surgeon. And then at the back end of this, patient applications. Um, what are we doing with uh, wearable monitors, uh, trackers, things like this to look at what patients are doing postoperatively, what things are the most important. And we're, we're then on the back end using data associated with these kind of things uh, 
to help us determine, okay, which parts of what we just did are really important. And, and I think that is something that, that highlights the uh, potential for artificial intelligence. We're certainly dealing with massive amounts of data. Um, we as surgeons uh, all the time are, are manipulating many, many variables at one time. So uh, it really takes a, an absurd amount of computational power to try to look at those and come back to what's most important uh, in these equations to, uh, to give value for our patients. Um, a lot of us, I think, do believe that this intelligent surgery ecosystem um, will probably be transformational uh, for companies uh, that are in the orthopedic space for surgeons, uh, hopefully in terms of the uh, accuracy of what they're doing, and most of all, hopefully for our patients. In that intelligent surgery ecosystem, Companies want to work with surgeons on novel technologies uh, that can grow their revenue uh, and their market position and also shrink their cost. It, it can be both. A lot of these technologies are expensive initially, and then the cost of those declines uh, and things get more uh, palatable on their end uh, for doing things like that. Surgeons just have ideas and want to develop things. Technology gives them uh, power to assist in doing that. And patients are most motivated by their outcomes. They want better, safer surgeries. So again, we see that model of the intelligent surgery ecosystem. This is a uh, segmentation, a plan for a spinal fusion surgery. And you can see uh, the level of detail um, that's created with auto segmentation of this imaging uh, using artificial intelligence, using an AI algorithm. Uh, versus what's done manually. And uh, equally or more important, this is done much, much faster. So producing this uh, level of detail, this segmentation can be done extremely quickly with AI. You're again seeing preoperative planning of spinal deformity correction with this technology and then carrying through into the OR where you're uh, correlating with the uh, aforementioned imaging. Uh, augmented reality is becoming increasingly uh, present in the space in uh, spine surgery and in arthroplasty. You're seeing uh, the first uh, few generations of these type of systems that really correlate that three-dimensional modeling, three-dimensional imaging to what the surgeon is seeing in the operating room and just giving more information in a heads up display format that can be integrated into the surgery. Uh, again, aimed at more accuracy. Three dimensional representation of that in this slide. Patient specific guides for implant surgery. In this uh, picture, you see a uh, PSI guide on a cadaver for a knee replacement. Um, AI is already being applied uh, to this in a very interesting way. So at present, patient-specific guides for knee replacement almost exclusively are CT-based. There are one or two systems that are MRI-based. Um, AI allows this or will allow this to be done with two-dimensional imaging where the algorithm essentially learns from seeing enough x-rays and enough anatomy that it can base what it's doing on its learned knowledge and apply that to what it's seeing and take a two-dimensional image and convert it into a three-dimensional model that then becomes the basis for uh, the patient-specific guides. So this is a situation where the technology is actually eliminating potentially eliminating the need for that three-dimensional imaging. So it's less radiation exposure for the patient, it's less cost, it's less delay uh, for that surgery, while still providing a very high level of accuracy with those patient-specific guides. A situation where the AI essentially allows the technology that exists to become better, cheaper, and faster, and safer.
apps, as we talked about, just more information. Uh, we want to know how to integrate all of this. We want to know if technologies like robotics are enabling us, if they're making us better. And we want to use these to incorporate the clinical outcomes that we're getting and tell us what technologies we should be using and when. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for that presentation and for sharing the amazing work NHATCH is doing in the realm of AI. We've had a great program so far and we'll now take a four minute break. We will resume our presentation in the lecture hall shortly. Dave Briggs, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Chang. Our first sponsor is Medtronic, who as a company is leading the way with intelligent and connected patient solutions. For anyone interested in more information about these truly exceptional solutions, please follow the link posted in the Zoom chat function and back to the lecture hall, Dr. Chang. Thank you, Dave. I'm now excited to introduce Dr. Izzy Lieberman, the president of the Texas Back Institute and a great friend of mine. Izzy will be presenting on the evolution of robotics in the OR. Thanks for being here tonight, Izzy. Hello, I'm Izzy Lieberman. I'm one of the orthopedic and spine surgeons at the Texas Back Institute. I'd like to thank Boyle for inviting me along um, on this. Uh, this is a, a wonderful series of talks and lectures and some great speakers. And also thank Robin Young for including me in this. I'd like to share with you some of the work, some of the experiences that I've had with robotics and spine surgery and where the genesis came from and what I feel is, is the future, where we are gonna go with this. Uh, in the spirit of disclosures, I do have relationships with the listed companies up there of which Globus and Medtronic do have robotic platforms. Uh, I have been a consultant to Medtronic Mazor on the robotic platform, not the Globus on, on their robotic platform. When it comes to spine surgery, traditionally what we do is we measure with a micrometer, we put up our x-rays, we create the angles, we do all this stuff, but then we end up cutting with a chainsaw. For years, we lacked the precision, we lacked the efficiency that we really needed to do an optimal 
job for our patients. But that was because we just didn't have the tools for it. For a long time now, I've gone on record as saying the decision is far more important than the incision. And yeah, everyone agrees less invasive surgery is appropriate. But what's most important is the decision, the planning of what is the right surgery to do and how to do that. And within spine surgery, it really is all about control. You have to maintain control. You don't want to end up in this kind of situation where you're crashing and burning and you don't have a plan B, plan C, or plan D if something happens. You have to be able to call that audible. Now, the rise of spine, spine robots is really because of those, those three things, to try to be more efficient, more precise, to get the planning in there, and to be able to adapt as you're going on the fly. And we've seen in multiple other uh, industrial sectors, uh, public sectors, government sectors, everything's robotics these days, everything's automated these days. And in medicine, we, we've been behind. We haven't kept up with everything else that's going on out there. Now, this was really the genesis of it. And in 2002, Professor Moshe Shoham and I wrote this grant for robotic guidance for spinal interventions. It was an R&D proposal. And it was based on percutaneous translaminar screw fixation. And I thought that this would be an ideal way where we can minimize the insult. We can use some kind of robotic technology to place these screws to automate the surgery. In retrospect, this was a good idea, but using the robot for this was far more cumbersome than just doing it the way we used to do with a small mini open incision. So this was the, the fallout of it, but this is really where everything started. And the evolution started with the small robot, the six uh, arm parallel manipulator that we had with the side arm on it and evolved to the big robot. And keep these in mind, small robot, big robot dichotomy when we start talking about what other cases we can do. Now, the one most important lesson that I learned over the last 20 years being involved in robotics is the value of preoperative planning. Not one of us would ever let a general contractor build our house without some kind of blueprint, without some kind of bill of material, without some kind of budget. Likewise, no one would ever get on an airplane if the pilot didn't have his pre-flight plan, didn't check the weather, didn't know what the payload was going to be, didn't know how much fuel he has on board. So the planning and the checklist, we have been absolutely behind the times in this as spine surgeons. And the value of coming to the operating room with a preoperative plan has just become so important because the whole team knows what you're doing and it sets the tone for the surgery. Now, the genesis and the future. Uh, if you look at robotics and navigation and some of the other new technologies coming along, really we can parallel those with the industrial revolution and with the evolution of the personal computer. I've had the uh, privilege of just recently editing an article by Sivaganasan and Kreshi, and, and it was really well written. And, and please look forward to this. It's going to be in one of our our journals very soon, but they really outline these two concepts where we parallel the growth of robotics compared to the industrial revolution and predict the future of robotics navigation and spine technology when you look at the evolution of the personal computer. So if we look at the industrial revolution, that's when humans kind of transition from skill artisans to machine technology. As a skilled artisan, you were doing things freehand. The quality was variable. It was very labor intensive. But we got to the machine tools where the workpiece and the tool are then guided. And you were able to plan and execute when the workpiece and the tool were linked together. And it also led to 
mass production, more efficiency. So if we take that to the spine robot revolution, which started sometime in the early 2000s, we started as spine artisans, freehand placement of implants, variable quality, despite the fact that we all thought we were the best and we can put pedicle screws in perfectly. They weren't always in the right spot. And it was pretty labor intensive. It took a lot of different things to get those screws in appropriately. Now we learned from it and we did get more efficient, but now with the robots that we have, the tools and implants are being used. We come to the operating room with a preoperative plan and we can execute with precision and we have much greater efficiency in the operating room with these new tools. So you can see the parallel between the industrial revolution and what we've got is the spine robot revolution and how we went from the skilled artisans to the machine technology in the spine robots. But the evolution does continue. We've got multiple technologies on the shelf. And as spine surgeons, in fact, all medical surgical specialties, we're in a privileged position now in that we've got all this wonderful technology. We just have to figure out how to use it, how to bring it together. And now we've brought together the best of navigation and the best of robotic guidance. So you have multiple different modalities and it's not gonna stop with navigation and robotics. Augmented reality is here and it's here to stay and it's gonna be integrated. There's gonna be all sorts of other technologies that we can't even appreciate yet that we're gonna be able to incorporate into what we're doing. So when we look at navigation and robotic guidance, what has been good? Well, it definitely minimizes the intraoperative radiation exposure. It does improve our screw placement precision. It does improve pullout resistance because we can plan and put the screw in the best spot. We get better deformity corrections. Doing the planning and executing with the computer, with the robot allows us to recognize some of the subtle anatomic variants. It provides for less invasive exposures. And again, it enhances the operative efficiency. And this is just a typical case that I like to show, a straightforward degenerative spinal anesthesis at the three, four level. Here you can see your MRI scan, CT scan, no surprises here. Here is my preoperative plan. I can see the placement of the screws. I can do my transforaminal interbody fusion and plan that out and look at the correction that I'm going to get. And it's all done through these small incisions. But what we also can do is ensure that we're doing the exact same operation. And by that, I mean ensuring the fusion by drilling out the facet joint, even in a pre-planned percutaneous fashion, the facet joint on the contralateral side to the t -lip. So here you can see in this series of x-rays where I've got the drill and I'm drilling out the facet joint. I then pack it with bone graft. I then do my distraction. I then place my t -lip cage and I get everything shut down. And here's her CT scan that was done immediately post-op. You can see in the middle scan on the right-hand side where we've done the t -lip. And you can see where I was able to drill out the facet joint on the left-hand side of the picture, the, the right-hand side of the, the patient. And here's her long-term uh, follow-up studies. You can see the cage in place. You can see the fusion consolidating. You can see how I was able to restore the alignment and maintain the stability. So when we look at navigation and robotic guidance, what does what best? Navigation allows us to align the trajectories in three-dimensional space. It does position our start point in three-dimensional space. It gives you feedback verifying your position as you are going through the surgery. And it does also facilitate a freehand component of the surgery, should you wish to do that. Robotic guidance positions our drill holes. It can position us to actually cut bone to perform the osteotomies to do the decompression. And now we're getting semi-active and even active robots that are going to be removing bone for us, or maybe even putting the screws in. 
But all of this ties together in that navigation and robotics facilitates the surgeon's plan. So what has been challenging? Well, registration has been challenging in some of them because it's a global registration. Tracking systems can be subject to deviations if the reference ray is bumped. The error of accuracy is down around three millimeters, which is good, but is that good enough for us right now? And it's a virtual tracking. So it's not really real time. If, if you're off, you may not know that because it's a virtual environment. And also the spine can snake, can move underneath with pressure. So you have to be wary of that when you're using the navigation technologies. In robotic guidance, with the open cases in particular, it's soft tissue pressure can cause deviations and there can be skiving off of the bony surfaces if you don't plan for a good landing spot. Registration in obese or osteoporotic patients can be difficult. And you still have to use real-time verification with your x-rays to ensure that you've gotten those screws or other implants in the right spot. But now we can th start thinking about the future. Where do we go from here? And, and I frequently look at the, the evolution of robotics like a little kid. We were 20 years ago in the infant stage. 15 years ago was kind of the toddler stage. We started getting up and, and moving around a little bit. 10 years ago, we were in the, the childhood stage where we started to run and do things. Five years ago, we got to the... Uh, teenage stage where we got a little more rambunctious and active and we're doing a lot more. But now we've got to get into this maturation phase to, to really evolve the robotics. And if, if we want to predict the future, all we need to do is look at what happened with personal computing over the last 40, 50 years. It started off with Moore's law that said the capacity of transistors and a lot of the chips are gonna exponentially increase over the years, which we've seen. We've seen the miniaturization of the computers, but the two most important things I think were the internet connectivity and the apps that have come up. When one computer can talk to another, it changed the whole environment. We can now communicate, plan, do things in a complete completely different way than what we did 20 and 30 years ago. And we've got these specific apps that are out there for just about everything, Google Maps, and you look at Facebook and YouTube and, and all the other things that we have access to. So spine robotics, yeah, they're gonna become more efficient. They're gonna become much less expensive over time. Again, the technology is out there. Big robots and small robots. You want to make sure you use the right tool for the right reason. And I suspect what we're going to see is that we're going to have small, more nimble, uh, more appropriate robots for one or two level cases, maybe anterior procedures, maybe anterior cervical procedures as they come out. And we're going to have our big robots for the large deformity tumor correction revision cases. So we're gonna have different tools. The interconnectivity and the remote access, I think is gonna be phenomenal. When one or two or three or 10 or 100 of these spine robots can start talking to each other, we can start comparing cases and doing the right thing for that patient with the predictive analytics that may be built in. And we've all heard about remote surgery. There's already stuff like that going on. The remote connectivity is just going to make it that much safer for patients where we can interact with our colleagues anywhere in the world during the case. And then after the case, we're going to have intraop and postoperative data sharing. And that data sharing is really going to be the foundation for procedural applications, preoperative planning of a transforaminal interbody fusion preoperative planning of a scoliosis deformity correction, preoperative planning and execution of a tumor procedure with corpectomy and instrumentation. You're going to have, we're going to have, we're going to develop 
these procedural applications so that we can provide our patients with patient-specific, level-specific implants and solutions. So that's where I see the evolution going. Now, a lot of people over the years um, kind of criticized, not criticized, but, but really weren't supportive of, of the robotics and some of the work that I did. And I can pull my shirt off and show you the, the scars in my back from the arrows that were tossed at me. But I've maintained for a long time that robotics and navigation is not going to make a bad surgeon good. What it does is it makes a good surgeon more efficient and more precise. And those that aren't going to make the time for this will be left behind. They're, they're not going to be providing their patients with the best possible care. So where I see the future is patient-specific planning and implants accompanied by disposable instruments with just-in-time delivery performed in an outpatient center using the most appropriate, least invasive access facilitated by robotics and navigation providing for predictable outcomes for our patients. And with that, I'd like to thank you all and uh, we can entertain questions during the question session. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Izzy. Great presentation, my friend. Up next is a presentation from Dr. Jeff Gom, also a friend of mine from Norton Leatherman Spine Center, who will go more into the depth into the use of robotics. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, I would like to thank uh, OTW Broadcasting and uh, for this opportunity, and Pearl Chang for uh, moderating this and uh, helping coordinate everything. Uh, this, my name is Jeffrey Gum. I'm from Norton Leatherman Spine Center in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. I'm also affil affiliated with the University of Louisville Department of Orthopedics. I'm going to be talking about introducing robotic assisted surgery into my spine surgery practice. Um, here's my disclosures. Um, so, SRS is one of my favorite meetings. I love deformity, I love um, all aspects of it. And the 50th meeting, I'll never forget, it was in 2015. And uh, one of the big panels was Steve Glassman, Larry Linky, Dave Pauly. I think there were a few other folks that were there that were invited to come up and give a talk um, about where spine surgery was the last 50 years, where they've come from, and where do they think they're going over the next 50 years. And what was interesting is everybody was very excited about uh, the opportunity to get the talk. And they said across the board, when they started to put the talk together, they felt a little disappointed of where the last 50 years has taken us in spine. I mean, obviously, we have more elegant biologics, more elegant instrumentation, um, and, and we've evolved, but they felt like there wasn't this big, massive breakthrough in spine surgery, right, as far as what our OR looked like. And across the board, they agreed that the next 50 years is going to look drastically different than what the previous 50 years looked like. And... Um, an analogy for me, especially within the robotic space, is automotive industry. So in the upper left is a 1938 BMW Win Dixie, lower right is a 2018 BMW i8. So obvious differences in the car, the way the doors open, the sleekness, the sound system, the way it drives, right? But the thing that I'm trying to point out is the way those cars are made, right? So the, 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 in the early years of automotive industry, everything was by hand, right? There was no robotics or machinery that put it together. And the throughput of that was obvious, right? So you make, make 20, 30 cars a month, but every single piece is touched by hand. Nowadays, right? And this is a BMW factory down in Spartanburg. You can assemble a car from start to finish without a single hand touching the car. The parts even get delivered to the line. And the Tesla factory I hear, and I have some images on that are very similar, right? So there's over a thousand robots that touch the car. And some of these factories can take a sheet of aluminum or metal and have a fully assembled car in 90 minutes, right? So the amount of waste, the efficiency, all of that has been drastically improved with robotics in that space, right? I'm not saying we need to treat our patients like robots, but we can learn a lot from this space. We know that the, the annual shipments of industrial robots is going through the roof. That's obvious. Same with the estimated uh, supply of industrial robots worldwide. 
and also the other applications in medicine, right? So we talk about spine and orthopedics a lot, but there's over 30 applications of robotics in medicine as a whole. And the patent applications in the robotic space can just continues to skyrocket and go up. And this is a little older data ending in 17, but uh, the, the newer data is even showing a sharper increase in the number of patents in the space. A good example of uh, robotic dynamics growth is the Da Vinci. That's in, you know, a gold standard soft tissue type robot that the general surgeons utilize. And there's been over 5 million surgeries as of 2018 and 4,400 systems placed. That is a massive amount of systems placed within hospitals. I know our hospital system has two. They just bought two more to be placed. And so there's a huge growth. And what's interesting about the, the Da Vinci component with regards to robotics is they have taken procedures and made them gold standard. Robotic assistance in hysterectomy, prostatectomy, things like that are now considered the gold standard, which is amazing feat to do with that type of technology. So why is spinal robotic guidance so, so interesting? from beyond the surgeon like we love toys i want to play with the new toy in the toy box right but why is everybody else interested so here's a graph that shows annual volume on the left drg or reimbursement on the bottom right so prostatectomy hysterectomy even hip replacement or knee replacement look where those fall the, the reimbursement of those you know seven thousand to fifteen thousand volumes on the relatively low side look at thoracolumbar spinal fusion and so a volume of four hundred thousand procedures in the u.s reimbursement, mean reimbursement around 30K, and it's a lot higher than that now. So there's a lot of corporate folks and industry folks that are unbelievably interested in this space for this obvious reason, right? And this is, uh, again, a little dated, but there are a couple points that are starting to pan out. So one, it estimated that the, the, the amount of marketing, or not marketing, but the spine market within the robotic space to go from $26 million to 2.7 and 22. 2022, we've blown past that already in 2020, right? And so the new numbers, this estimation is was on the lower end. The other part of it is they predicted about when the penetration of robotics gets to 35% of the market, spine surgeons are gonna to start to demand this type of technology, right? And so we're not there yet, but it is getting close. Enabling technology and robotics is starting to look like it's gonna be the standard of care with regards to fixation placement. So all sorts of players in the market, right? So Stryker, uh, or Stryker has Omega, the Rosa, the Excelsius by Globus, Mazur by um, Medtronic now, which was formerly Mazur as a company by itself. So there's a lot of people playing in the space. Even our articles are giving guidance on list prices, features of these, right? To help surgeons in the hospital really evaluate, critically evaluate the components of these systems, right? So a lot of players in this space. So my, my story, of how I rolled into robotics, right? So I did my residency at Norton Leatherman, as where I currently practice, and my fellowship at WashU, which, uh, and now I'm currently relatively high volume, about 60, 40 degen versus deforming. But my approach to treatment of my patients was maximally invasive, not minimally invasive, maximally invasive. It was, there was no MIS component mentioned in either my residency or fellowship, right? In fellowship, you'd almost get laughed at if you brought something like that up, which I love my training. But I realized very quickly that I needed to learn MIS techniques to keep up with the, you know, my generation of surgeons, what could be offered to patients, right? And as I was finishing fellowship, I just started to really critically look at the robotic space and where it's at and where it could be head heading. So I just fell in love with this idea that we could really improve what we're doing in the operating room by incorporating robotics within our surgery. So I went into my hospital system. I told him I want, wanted a robot, right? And, and I spent 18 months arguing with him. And then I went from temper tantrums, kicking, screaming, like my six-year-old to, you know, really understand their return on investment. So I negotiated a 20-case trial. I slid in a couple extra cases, got 22 in. And what I learned from this was to understand the hospital's return on investment. What, what did they want? What were they looking at? Why were they hesitant? To incorporate this technology. So I started to pay attention to the economics per case. And uh, it's great because I do a lot of economics and spine research to show our value. And so at first I was going to pick the 40 cases. I ended up picking a bunch of single level degen spawnies and, and, and blew the trial out of, out of the water for a couple of reasons. One, I, I kind of cherry picked the cases. Two, I didn't want it to fail. Uh, and, and three, the, the cases I used it on were these kind of mid-lift, these cortical screws, it, it medial to lateral trajectory with the screws. 
you know, it's a mini open approach. I get to see what's going on. And what I fell into was a couple reasons why this is a phenomenal way to introduce this in your practice without being super disruptive with uh, this additive layer of technology. Number one, cortical screws, nobody freehands them, right? You have a cortical channel. You don't have this big cancellous channel that you can tactically feel if that screw is going in the wrong position. So people typically use fluoro or nav, right? And I was using nav at the time. My robotic system became substituted. So I didn't just layer in more steps into my workflow, right? So I took a step away, I added this in. And what that did is it, it shortened that learning curve out of the gate, right? So that's number one reason why I really fell in love with robotic assisted cortical screws. Number two, um, you know, as I mentioned, this Mitsor, uh, this Mitsor platform is really my springboard into enabling me to learn MIS techniques, right? And I really advocate folks to case selection. It's very important to be successful with this to start out, right? So why not start with PERC, right? I'm you know, not facile in PERC. The, this robotic type technology makes me, it makes it easy to incorporate it in your practice. Why not start out with large constructs, big deformity cases? That's what a lot of folks jump into. Right, and the downfall to that is you don't get to trust the technology. You don't learn how that technology works, right? So uh, it's a, Tesla is a great analogy. When I give this slide, how many people in the audience have a Tesla? About half the audience now raises their hand, it's crazy. So then I ask how many people use the autopilot to drive home? Nobody, nobody gets in a car they've never driven, hits a button and lets them drive home, right? You learn the car, you trust it, you drive it. So why would you do that with a new technology in surgery, right? So when you do these mini open approaches, right? So small incision, inside out trajectory, that is a great case to choose. You understand the failure points of technology, shift in sky, that's what's gonna burn you, utilizing this technology. Sky's where it goes off access a little bit, most of the time not clinically, but the benefit of these mini open approaches or open approaches to start with is you get to watch the cannula interface with the bone. You get to see the drill, the tap, the screw, go in a starting point that you plan and you see that happen. So you trust it before you really push the envelope of what the technology could do for you. That's the second reason why it's a great intro into your practice. Number three is I really got to plan and optimize my incision, right? So this is a good example of a construct. We have a lot of room to play in that sagittal plane. I converge everything on the skin, center my incision there, really small incision, but I still get to visualize everything. So it's not just blindly trusting the system. It's not me rolling into perk type of fixation without getting used to that to start with. Here's an, also an example of what we modified is my construct on the left, both are up and out, right? You see how those screws don't in, intersect on the skin to allow me to optimize my incision. In, in, image on the right, this is what I've modified it to. Now we can go through that facet joint, you're fusing that facet joint, right? You can violate it, it's no big deal. You're gonna prep it, pack it with graft anyway, but this is a modified construct on the right. So it allows us to really optimize that incision. Here's an, a planning image, right? So left is coronal, right sagittal, obviously. And then that image in the center, right, shows that mid-constructed distal construct screw where it can violate that facet. You're prepping it, you're fusing it. It doesn't look like that when you put the screw in, but you're able to do that and really converge everything on the skin. So it allows you to optimize that skin incision. So those three reasons, I just luckily fell into using robotic assist technology for this type of procedure. And it really allowed me to be successful in incorporating this technology into my into my operating room. So here's it's the final standing construct of uh, that that plan case. So again, you can't freehand cortical screws. They're substitute. So when you incorporate robotics, it's substitutive. That you get to visualize everything, Doc. It's this midline to outward trajectory allows you to optimize your incision. And the, the, the potential of this was to show economic impact and reduce variability. And so we went on to publish our first uh, series of cases and we did exactly that. EBL went down, OR and time went down, length of stay went down. We looked at cost, cost was about neutral with open cases for a couple of reasons, uh, disposables and incorporating the technology. We also published our technique with this, right? So this is now uh, um, uh, 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 available for you to go through. And I go through failure points where it's gonna burn you. So really a step-by-step -step approach how to incorporate this into your practice. Here's a quick video. You know, we've gone to a two-step workflow now. So we cannulate with a high-speed drill, right? 
and then we go straight to screw. We don't even tap, right? Even in a quarter quarter trajectory where everybody argues about tap line to line, tap one below, right? Oh, we don't even tap anymore, right? So we use the high speed drill. We cannulate that that, that cortical screw pathway via the pedicle, and then we go straight to screw. Which I don't show the screw for uh, uh, time's sake, but you can see here that blue is our live image, right? That's our high speed minus drill. That's a navigation array on it, and that went right down our plan trajectory. So currently, uh, over 350 robotic assistance surgeries with this technology, the majority have been cortical screws or mid-lift. It's a great way to introduce into your practice. And overall, we found out we've improved our OR efficiency, reduced blood loss and length of stay. And so Izzy just gave a phenomenal talk on this broad picture of robotics and where he thinks it's going. But I consider him one of the godfathers of robotic, robotic assisted surgery within the spine world. I'm gonna add to a couple of those things. So I think what's next for robotics, it is a platform to really capture data, right? You're forced to plan, you're forced to execute with the same system and we capture all that data and analyze it afterwards. All of a sudden you have billions or millions of data points, right? Which is very powerful. It's our new currency in spine. We're going towards automated planning, right? So pretty soon the system's going to get smart. No, hey, Dr. Gum planned this case the same way 50 times. Let's pre-populate that, plan certain trajectories. Also, robotic-assisted decompression, right? So imagine when the system can start your decompression, right? Maybe not do the whole thing to start with, but my father works in a wood shop where there's a saw blade that if you try to stick your hand in, it won't cut your hand, right? So we, we have technology similar to that manipulating Dura, right? We just haven't incorporated it yet. So the technology is out there, right? I think this is going to be that springboard that everybody says, man, I really need to look at this technology now when it starts to help us with our decompression. We're not there yet. We're getting there. Automated screw insertion. Bony anatomy is very reproducible. Very soon, it's going to be able to put screws in for us. Also, I think overall about 75% of what we do can be automated to improve on safety and efficiency, right? Look at a pilot nowadays, right? What's What percentage of that flight is a pilot flying the plane from takeoff to landing on a commercial flight with 400 people in the back, right? So a lot of that has been automated. And the, another big part of it is waste reduction, right? So it, at our center, to pop a pan's about 180 bucks, right? Deforming case 10, 15, 20 pans, it's crazy. Just open the pans, right? And the amount of inventory we use in those pans is about 1%. That's crazy waste in the OR. If I could pre-plan all my screws, still pack, pop them on the field, just from the fixation alone, we're reducing the number of trades in our system. And that's low hanging fruit. There's a lot of steps within the process that we could get to this massive waste reduction. So overall, I think robotic assisted cortical screws are a really good way to introduce robotics into your practice and allows you to gradually ease into really what this type of technology could do for you in the operating room. So I appreciate everybody's time and uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Jeff. A great follow up and really great information. We will now be taking our second break. Dave, over to you in our exhibit hall. Our second sponsor this evening is Globus Medical, who has a comprehensive robotic navigation platform that will work with any imaging system.
For anyone interested in more information about these comprehensive robotic navigation systems, please follow the link posted in the Zoom chat function. And back to our lecture hall, Dr. Chang. Thank you, Dave. Our next presentation is from Dr. Frank Phillips, Director of Minimally Invasive Spine Surgery at the Rush University Medical Center. Frank will be discussing his work with augmented reality in spine surgery. Thank you for joining us today, Frank. Well, thank you, Boyle. Um, my name is Frank Phillips, and I'm excited to be here talking today about augmented reality in spine surgery. The uh, future is now. Uh, as you can see, a list of my disclosures, the uh, one that's particularly relevant to this talk um, is Augmetics, um, on whose products I'll be talking and I do consult for the company. So let's uh, start defining different types of reality um, and how they might or might not apply in the medical space. So virtual reality is a fully immersive artificial environment, much like the uh, artificial reality games people play um, in uh, using uh, computers and iPads. Um, then augmented reality virtual is a virtual overlay um, into the real world. So real world in, is enhanced with digital objects. And then even uh, more uh, contemporary is mixed reality, which are virtual objects anchored within the real world setting. And the user has opportun opportunity to interact with both the real world and the virtual environment. So augmented reality is a technology that essentially integrates digital information into the user's real world environment, which in turn offers a new approach for treatments in medicine. AR can potentially be used to aid in surgical planning and execution. When we think about spine and where these technologies might apply, we think of what the current solutions for minimally invasive spine surgery is. Uh, generally, historically, we've used a lot of fluoroscopy, which results in high radiation to the patient, surgeons, and OR staff, and all the negative sequelae of uh, high doses of uh, fluoroscopy radiation to all of those parties. It also results generally in a less efficient workflow and putting one or sometimes two C arms in the operating room is a large OR footprint, making it difficult to work around. We've evolved more recently to navigation and robotics. Uh, both of those are very high capital investments, have large OR footprint with navigation, there's distraction from the patient with attention shift where you're looking away from the field to a monitor. Um, it often is not integrated well into the surgical workflow. There's a, generally a long learning curve has been shown, particularly with robotics, with increased OR times early on, uh, sometimes leading to low rates of adoption. And line of sight issues between trackers and markers. Uh, often people move their hand in a certain way, they lose the, uh, the direct line between the tracker and the marker, and the uh, navigation image suddenly disappears. And most of these products, or many of them, are often tied to specific implants. So when we could dial into each one of those, navigation is being shown to enhance skew accurately, accuracy, and it eliminates radiation for the OR staff versus the uh, patient who's getting a, essentially a CT scan for navigation. The cons are also the expense. It's generally a more than a million dollar investment. It's cumbersome, attention paid to the monitor rather than the surgical field generally takes up a lot of the OR space. And as we've talked about line of sight challenges. Moving to robotics, I would contend that what robotics are today is navigation dressed up with an aiming arm. And it's used primarily as an uber expensive marketing plot. To date, robotics have unproven value despite many of the promises. And this uh, cartoon, I think, captures a lot of this. This robotic technology has been uh, driven by very uh, sophisticated programmers, designers, very skilled engineers. But at the end of the day, does it really provide something that we need or want? So in a perfect world, what do we need to enable MIA surgery? We need to make difficult tasks simple and reproducible. We'd like to eliminate radiation. We want accuracy without a difficult learning curve. Because remember, during that learning curve, it's often our patients that are paying the price. Uh, we would want 2D and ideally 3D visualization of the spine. 
We want the uh, technology to enhance, not retard surgical efficiency. Ideally, it should be implant agnostic. And at the end of the day, the real test is it has to provide value defined as outcome over cost. So what's out there? I'm gonna just give you a taste of some of the AR technologies that exist or are almost out there. And then I'll talk about the technology we've been using at Rush. So this is a technology from Brain Lab, and it's essentially based on a microscope that ultimately uh, has a tracking system and converts the microscope image into 2D, 3D imaging. Uh, I'm not sure this has been released, and this is uh, more of a, 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 technique, a, a technique that's being evolved and being developed, but that's one of the techniques that's out there. Then holosurgical, which I'm proud to say was developed by uh, one of Chris Semenoff, one of my ex-fellows in the University of uh, Illinois in Chicago, essentially, uh, as you see in these images, uh, provides some degree of 3D imaging. It involves uh, uh, arrays in the field, a surgical tool, and still requires a distant tracker, which you see in the top image. That creates 2D imaging and then makes a 3D image, which is projected onto that screen that you, sit that you see sitting overlying the patient. So certainly a step in the right direction, but still doesn't get uh, by a lot of the limitations of some of the uh, navigation issues we've talked about. So I'm gonna to talk to you about augmented reality using the augmented system, which we've used as, at uh, Rush quite extensively over the last year. The focus is all on the surgical field. There's no remote tracking at all. There's no footprint in the OR. You have a ret retina display head headset and a laptop. It provides 3D augmented re reality images of the spine and 2D CT navigated images. And this is sort of looking down on the right, what the 3D image might look like intraoperatively with the skin intact. Unfortunately, it's difficult because, you know, obviously by virtue of being on a computer, we're seeing a 2D image, whereas this image would be beautifully displayed in 3D if you're using the system in the patient. Uh, so what is X-Vision? You have a headset which is wireless, so allows free movement within the OR. It's personalized for each uh, customer. It fit matches your interpupillary distance. There's a built-in surgical tracking system. It's built into the headset, so there's no distant cameras or uh, anywhere outside of the surgical field that the instruments have to talk to or connect to. Um, and it provides 2D and 3D imaging in the, surg in the surgery. So this is what it looks like in the real live OR. There's absolutely no footprint. It's very intuitive, natural posture and field of view. You're working just as you would if you were doing this uh, without the augmented reality. There's minimal disruption of surgical flow, short learning curve, natural line of sight of the tracking camera, and it's an open platform. So this just gives you a taste of what it looks like with the skin intact. We see full visualization of the patient and the surgical field. And we provided 2D axial sagittal images like you would with any navigation, but also a 3D view of the spine, which is projected directly onto the headset lens and essentially on your retina. So with the skin intact, it's like you're looking at the spine laid out in front of you. Um, so here you see what it looks like in the OR, uh, two headsets. There I am with my fellow. We're both seeing the exact same thing, um, easy to teach. Uh, we don't have to look away from the field at any time. Our eyes are always focused on the patient. Um, this is the external monitor, which uh, everybody else in the OR is seeing, obviously 2D and not 3D imaging, but gives you a sense of uh, what everyone sees while uh, we're working with the headsets. Is this accurate? We did a study at Rush uh, presented in Journal of Neurosurgery last year. Uh, a lot of screws from the thoracic down to the sacral level. Accuracy in the lumbosacral spine of 100% in the thoracic 98.2 with the screw tip deviating less than two millimeters from plan trajectory and about 1.3 degrees. So this was well within the FDA specifications and resulted in FDA approval. So just kind of wind it up, I'm gonna give you the first MIS case we did and actually the first MIS case ever done with this technology, a 51 year old female prior L45 fusion a number of years ago presents with new onset symptoms, uh, back pain, neurogenic symptoms, an MRI showing uh, stenosis at the level above at L3-4 and a spondylolisthesis at the level below at L5-S1. So with this, uh, our plan was to do an all lateral uh, inner body construct, so a lateral anterior inner body fusion, a lateral X-lip at L3-4, 
and then instrumentation, screws prone using augmented reality. So these are some fluoroscopic imaging. That's our lateral ALIF, the patient in the lateral position, essentially doing the exact same ALIF we would with them supine. So you see the cage going in. And without having to reposition, we do our lateral three, four X lift procedure. And there you see cages above and below the old fusion. Then uh, we get into the augmented reality, a small incision with a spinous process reference marker. Here we are going to it. There you see myself and my fellow working. Uh, we're looking right down at the surgical field. Here's the 3D visualization again on the monitor, not really what we're seeing. And it's interesting, you can see on the 3D, but in 2D image on the right, you see some of the screws we put in. You can actually see the uh, screw holes from the screws we removed to be replaced. You can actually see the fusion mass down there. And it gives you excellent 3D visualization of all of this anatomy. And here again, this is sort of what it looks like as we work through the skin. Yeah, you can see one of the old screws, the trajectory was somewhat lateral. So we're uh, changed it and redirected it using a combination of the 2D and 3D imaging. Yeah, you see uh, just some live footage from the case. And there you see us putting a screw in. And then you see both the 2D navigation images and the 3D images obviously taken from the monitor, not from our headset, where we'd be seeing all of this in beautiful three dimensions. Uh, that's what the uh, intra-op perk screws look like. And then you have some post-op imaging, which I think uh, looks pretty good. So in conclusion, I think augmented reality is really uh, going to evolve and become a part of what we do. It's accurate. It makes us better surgeons. It's extremely efficient. It flows with the case. It's economically viable. There's no large capital expenses. It probably costs 10% of what a robot would cost which makes it attractive for alternate environments outside the hospital, like surgery centers. It's transportable. You really just need a headset and a laptop and you're ready to travel. So if you work out of multiple surgery centers like I do, I can just travel with this. I don't need new equipment everywhere I go. So I think at the end of the day, navigation, robotics, augmented reality, where do they all fit? I think at the end of the day, we got, there's a buffet of technologies uh, that will customize for the appropriate patient, for the appropriate pathology, and the appropriate venue. Much like there's a place for relatively simple iPhones versus iPads versus laptops versus desktop. And they're not mutually exclusive. I think we'll choose in which situation any one of these technologies provides the greatest value. Um, I would contend that robots that are currently out there need to be more than $1 million plus aiming devices. And I suspect over time they, they will and do things that we really need help with. Um, and I think at the end of the day, enabling technologies that enhance accuracy, efficiency, and provide true value will prevail. And uh, with that, I thank you, and I will uh, end off there. Great talk. Thank you again, Frank. Our last presentation today is from Richard Benson, co-founder and CEO of Fundamental VR with some great insight into using VR to train surgeons. Excited to have you with us, Richard. Hello, my name is Richard Vincent. Um, I'm going to talk to you briefly about virtual reality and surgical training. Um, I've been involved in this sector now for about seven or eight years, uh, developing a business in, in this area. So hopefully I can share a few interesting um, uh, areas for you. So I've been asked to cover three areas really. So how does VR surgical training work? Um, how well does it train surgeons and uh, does, how does it actually simulate uh, VR? Now in eight or nine minutes, it's gonna be very difficult to, to do any more than just touch the surface on that, but I will try and address all of those different uh, points. So let's start by just looking at VR. Here's some examples uh, of VR in action. Um, you can see here a number of different modalities. The key thing here really I wanted to illustrate is that there's, there's kind of two ways that VR can work. In the top left, you can see a standalone headset. So this is a fully self-contained headset with the processing and everything else in the visor that's there. Great low cost way of learning. Uh, limited fidelity because of the graphics card and the computing power that's in that headset, but, but great for base level uh, learning and collaboration. On the right hand side and along the bottom, you see tethered VR, which is where we're using a PC or a laptop to, to power the graphics and the interaction. And also then the haptics, um, much higher fidelity, much higher fidelity, both in visual and haptic uh, interaction. Um, and of course, 
technology is advancing fast, so we'll continue to reduce the requirements for uh, external processing and, and move everything into a standalone space over time. Now, haptics, um, top left, you'll see those gaming controllers that come with a VR controller. They buzz, they vibrate. That's a basic haptic interaction. It tells you kind of binary, good, bad, off, on. Across the bottom, you're seeing um, a much more sophisticated haptic, a, a kinesthetic haptic, which can replicate the weight, the heft, the resistance, the force feedback of surgical interaction, replicating real world, where you can start to build up muscle memory. And that's the big difference between those, the, those two areas. Um, how well does it train surgeons? Well, the top left-hand one is great at doing procedures, uh, procedural awareness, so getting used to the steps and the tools, et cetera. But if you wanna build the skill, then you're gonna need the haptics that you see as part of the, the bottom, uh, uh, two images and the one on the right, because that's when you start to be able to do, uh, uh, understand how it feels to do it right or to do it wrong, to, to push too far, to plunge through when you're starting to drill or to overream something or to, to resect it in the wrong way. You can feel that with the, the other areas. And when you've got that, that combination of immersion through VR and the kinesthetic haptics that come from the, the, the sort of things you see in the bottom, then you start to get real skills transfer. The other thing that VR is great at is situational awareness and I'll uh, just move on the slide as I talk about that. So you can see that here. So we're able to put people fully into the, immersed into the space. Let me just turn the signs off, there we go. Um, so you start to get that, that pressure, that uh, immersion, that full contextual awareness of, of being inside a virtual real operating theater, bringing in other people, distractions, noise, etc. You see, it's very easy for me to turn away from this screen and look at something else and just be back in the real world. Whereas when I'm in virtual reality, we're fully immersed into that space. And never more so than when we have our colleagues around us. And you can see that really here illustrated with, with the images that are coming up now. This is an example of collaborative virtual reality. So we're able to bring people together from anywhere in the world into any type of environment. On the right, they're sharing a case file and annotating it together. On the left, they're, uh, they're running through a procedure uh, to, to rehearse and understand and do the teamwork um, and all of that without ever leaving their office, their home or their hospital. Um, a seamless is just popping on a headset and being in that moment. So that's where it really becomes a really powerful tool along with that, that uh, skills transfer capability. Now I'm often asked about the quality of, of the imagery and, and, and the, uh, the, 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 the materials that you get within VR. So some examples here, the highest quality can be achieved. Now it's constrained by the hardware today, the VR headsets can't run at the highest, highest level with, a, with an off the shelf standard product. You have to get into a very expensive product but that will change over time. So what we do is build to the highest level of quality, knowing that the, the hardware will catch up over time and that works very well. What we also do is uh, as part of all of the, the, the work we do across multiple different sectors, and you can see some uh, um, examples here uh, in uh, orthopedics, is provide overlays. Um, overlays that will give you instruction and give you real-time feedback. So you can see some overlays on the right-hand side of the screen here. You can see some real-time feedback on the left-hand side in terms of the angles of approach, et cetera, all fed back immediately to the, uh, to the, uh, the user of the system of the virtual reality. And all of that then going into a uh, data dashboard as well that allows you to build up a profile of learning over time, which is essential as part of, again, a blended learning uh, situation. So this is mineable data, not just usage and attendance, but also knowledge levels, skills levels, right down to one surgical objective within a very long procedure that can all be mined and understood. And of course, our level of, of measurement is, is far deeper than you'll get in the real world. We measure telemetry, so the, the, the way that your hands are moving, the way your head's moving, the eyes are moving, all of that can be measured and used against validated measures of skill development to really give you great insight 
into someone's skills and, and capability. And all of it, in the end, this is all about getting repetition and getting people along the learning curve faster. So it's a great tool for all of those sort of activities. Now, what sort of VR is good for what types of, of use cases? Well, if we just look at it from this standpoint, going from very inexperienced through to highly experienced, there's a number of different types of VR you can use. Kind of the, the, the core systems kind of in that mid range of learning and refining skills work very well with a kind of combination of VR and haptic. At the lower level, entry level, you might be using a, a, a slightly lighter weight headset uh, that will give you procedural understanding. And at the other end of the extreme, you'll be, you might be using a full haptic system that's allowing you to really understand new techniques uh, and, and develop those skills ahead of going into a human uh, operating theatre and, and interacting there. So starting with the left hand side, uh, we, we work with people like NYU. So we're delivering uh, systems that go out to uh, medical students at their home to, make a, to help them make assessment of who's coming onto a residency programme or not by doing remote collaboration and assessment. Um, in the mid range, uh, a good example would be in, in orthopaedics is in the NHS in uh, the Southwest Deanery, where the systems are used, virtual reality is used as part of a, uh, a blended learning program and is mandated. Um, examples of that again in action here, you can see with this one, this is from a tibial nail, and you can see some of the live imaging capabilities that these systems will deliver as, as someone's learning the skill here of getting their uh, their approach correct before they start that, that, that uh, nailing uh, process. And this will give real time feedback. You'll see the advancement in a second of that uh, drill into the, uh, uh, into the leg. as you can see there. And so it continues and just to keep moving forward. And then at the very high end, uh, a good example here is, uh, a, a, this is with, for a gene therapy where this system is used now to uh, train and accredit uh, a consultant level uh, ophthalmologists ahead of this very expensive procedure that, that they're then able to, to undertake. So where does it all fit in? Well, blended learning is obviously the key thing and VR has a role to play in that. You know, in the early stage of, of deciding um, about somebody coming into a, uh, a training event, it can be used to pre-qualify to understand where their skills levels are at any one particular time. Then before they go into a cadaveric session or a wet lab session, it can be used to familiarize them and to build up some muscle memory and skills that they could then can refine as they go into a cadaveric session, post that session and get the best they can then out of that session. Post that session, they can then use again a haptic system to continue to build up that confidence and also fill the gap between the training session with the cadaveric model or the, uh, uh, or the wet lab that gap between that and actually going into the live OR can be filled with virtual reality and just keep that, that muscle memory up, keep those confidence levels and capabilities up. And then of course it can be used along the line back at home with a, a standalone system to just refresh and refine so that you know before the day before you can just go in again and just reassess and make sure that you've got those skills uh, and, and understanding correct obviously different use cases for different levels and, and of, of uh, surgeon capability. Um, but again, key thing, all of that driving into a data portal that allows you to really understand how skills are developing. This is not a game. This is about pre-human uh, skills capabilities. Those can be developed inside virtual reality. And there's a lot of great uh, capabilities out there. It's a very exciting time for, for this space. Um, does it make better surgeons? Well, there's an enormous amount of uh, validation now out there across a multitude of different systems that answers that question. And the answer is a resounding yes. Um, we can move people along the learning curve faster. Um, we can get you there into competency quicker. And uh, we can just give you much, much higher levels of repetition. You know, in the robotic space, the uh, published data suggests that anywhere between 30 and 100 cases are needed to get up to proficiency levels with certain robots. Well, 
you're never going to achieve that within a cadaveric environment. So you're going to be doing a lot of that in a live OR environment, supplementing that with a virtual environment that allows you to practice and practice with a digital twin of the environment, the tools, the robots is a fantastic place to be and, and a, a place where a lot of our clients are now working. Um, so I hope that's useful. Thank you for your attention and uh, have a good course. Thank you. Thank you so much for that great presentation, Richard. And with that, we conclude our talks for this evening. Panelists, please turn on your video as we move into our live Q&A section. Well, I have to say, I, uh, I really love the presentations. It's, it's just wonderful. And I'm glad we're going to be uh, posting this on our YouTube and, and you know, promoting it out through the channels. Uh, that last presentation from, uh, on, on Fundamental VR, I have a question that I just throw out to all of you guys and the attendees as well. So are those virtual reality training programs complementary or in some level competing with uh, robotics or at least where robotics is heading? Well, I, I'd say they're complementary. Uh, it's, it's not one or the other. They have different purposes and they're going to overlap. Uh, there's no doubt about it. What you, what you learn as you're trained in a VR environment, you're going to apply to the next generation of surgical tools that we have. So I, I have no doubt that they're very complementary and it's an extension of what we're going to be doing. Yeah, I would agree with that. It seems like almost uh, it, it, the, some of these things may just replace the display and, uh, and obviously VR may be a bit more than that. Well, the, uh, you know, one of the things when I was at Boyle's meeting just last week, I had a great talk with uh, Paul Arnold and he talked about the early days when he was training his residents how to get a resident to think in 3D and the techniques he used to get residents to think that way. With the robotics system and the, and the imaging and, and, and all of that, uh, how important is it for surgeons five years from now or 10 years from now to have to think in 3D? Won't these systems essentially take that over? I don't think they're going to take them over. Uh, surgeons are still responsible for what's going on. Uh, there are individuals that do have that three-dimensional cognitive capacity, and they become surgeons. Uh, there are individuals that don't have that capacity, and quite frankly, they're weeded out of the surgery programs very early. Um, now, very few get that far down the surgery program that that don't have that ability to think and move uh, their hands in that three-dimensional way with the eye-hand coordination. Uh, I, I look at it as an athletic endeavor. It's, it's like a, a professional golfer with the, the end of the club and his eye-hand coordination or a baseball player with a bat or a hockey player. It's the same thing. Some people have it, some people don't. Those that have it and have the ambition get involved in it. Boy, what do you think? There's a, a lot of development uh, that, uh, that, that I think augments certainly training programs, but I do think you have to have a native um, fundamental ability to, to, to visualize. And that's something that even in engineering, we don't, we, we go back to the, you know, the old drafting classes and it's been replaced by solid modeling. Some kids get it right away some kids need a little help but some some kids never really are able to grasp and 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 manipulate that uh, mental medicine ball if you will and i have a suspicion that's true for medicine and surgery as well you know izzy in your talk and by the way you are you all you give one of the greatest presentations about robotics going you really track it because you were in the very earliest stages of this and you really lived and worked through this this evolution as robots get cheaper and more powerful how fast do you think this cycle of obsolescence might turn out to be with these systems well thank you for the kind words first of all uh, as with everything it's it's a 
team effort. There were hundreds of people involved in, in this evolution of robotics across multiple disciplines, across multiple healthcare institutions, and across multiple medical device companies. So it, it's, it's part of this evolution. I can't predict the future, but if we look back at what's gone on with computational technology, with computers and Moore's law that I referred to and everything else, I think we're gonna see an exponential growth. Uh, Frank gave a great introduction to the VR stuff. Um, we've, we're gonna integrate that. There's no doubt in my mind. And there's so many smart people looking at it it's going to be here in a year or two. It's going to be a, a major tool in terms of what we use. Now, is it going to be the perfect tool at that point? No, but it's the evolution. You have to take those first couple steps to get to where you want to be. Are our iPhones perfect yet? No, they're not perfect yet. Will they ever be perfect? No, but we're seeing continuous evolutions of the smartphone technology that we couldn't have even imagined. 10 years ago. Boy. I, I, I echo uh, Rob and Sonam as I agree. Dr. Lieberman, that was a fantastic presentation. Izzy, I couldn't, uh, uh, man, that was, I, you, you enlightened me on what, on what happened. I have to ask you though, we, we, we look at what happened in total joint reconstruction and robot assisted procedure. And we talked about the unicondylar knee and, and how that single-handedly brought back that procedure. And, and you mentioned translaminar facet joint fixation, which has been tried many different ways, including drill guides and, and a number of different contraptions, much in the same way that people try to standardize to somewhat unicondylar. Why, why is it that unicondylar knees, uni knees are certainly now in the orthopedic space, uh, I would say much more prevalent than they were 10 years ago, um, attributable to robotic technology, but we don't see that with translaminar facet joint fixation. And, and I, it was fascinating to see the origin, the history, uh, 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 history that I, I, I didn't appreciate. But but we don't see that. And 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 why is robot uh, assisted procedures not benefited that approach? Because I I you know one of my, one of my first studies was looking at translaminar uh, facet joint fixation. It's still popular in, in, in some parts of Japan, but it certainly would benefit from from robot assisted uh, uh, or robot technology at least. So a couple points here. With all due respect to my orthopedic colleagues that are doing joints it really is pretty one dimensional compared to what we're doing in the spine. It's, it's nowhere near as complex. The pathology is nowhere near as diverse. So we're dealing with so many different things, so much, uh, so much more complicated biomechanics, neurophysiology. Uh, the exposures are completely different. It's just a much more complex thing in spine. Now, dropping down to the translaminar facet screw fixation, uh, the best analogy is, is looking at doing an anterior cervical discectomy and infusion. Do we really need a robot for that? It's such a small incision. You can get in there, you can get out. It's a very predictable, refined operation. Yeah, someday we're going to be doing it a little bit better, but the incremental improvement with technology for an ACDF is small. Likewise, that incremental improvement for translaminar facet screw fixation right. was probably pretty small, is probably pretty small, at least in, in my mind it was. By the time I set up the robot, by the time I did the registration, by the time I did the perk uh, holes and put the screws in, I could have done four other translaminar facet screw fixations. So the technology was great, it'll work for it, but it wasn't the right technology for that application. Oh. Now, virtual reality. I believe is going to be the right application for that. Why put four pedicle screws in and two rods in and cut down when you can just pin the facet joints if you've got something in front and you know the biomechanics of a facet screw fixation. There, you put the headset on and in 15 minutes, you're done. That makes sense. And that's the beauty of spine surgery. We've got all this technology we just have to figure out for what I'm going to do today, what's the right technology to pull off the shelf. Beautiful. Zeeshan, uh, I really appreciated your talk. You know, I'd asked you specifically to get us sort of anchor the discussion in freehand and then take us 
through from freehand and integrate that with these other approaches, the fluoroscopy, the navigation and robotics. And I thought you did a magnificent job. And as I was listening to you talk, that I, I was thinking about these new tools help us with execution, but I think actually the free, starting freehand actually has an influence on something else that would be clinical judgment that if you can feel it and move in that way, that also impacts that. How do you, what do you think about that? The, these tools help us execute better, but how do they relate to clinical judgment? And when you start freehand, I don't know, does that help you with your sense of anatomy and, and, and working with tissues? No, absolutely. You know, this is something that I, uh, someone mentioned in the talk as well that uh, you know, my, my, as far as my journey was, it did start with freehand and then it kind of went through a lot of these things. And actually Dr. Lieberman was the first one uh, to introduce me to robots, uh, to the robotic technology. So, um, you know, so, but I have gone through the transition. I, I've seen the different, uh, some of these technologies and worked with them. And even, uh, and currently I, work, I use robotics, I use navigation, I use freehand. So, you know, in my practice and the way I think of it, I think there's a role for everything. Uh, I think there's, there, there are definitely, uh, the majority of my practice is robotics, and I do think there's a huge role for it. And that's why I continue to use it because of its uh, you know, predictability and accuracy, like we, we heard in Dr. Lieberman's talk. Um, and, there's, a, and, uh, there's a learning curve here too, Zisha. So, and I thought Dr. Gum's discussion of a great way to get started with the cortical bone screw was interesting. So in your experience, what kind of a learning curve are you experiencing as you move into these new technologies? Interesting. I would say, I mean, at least in my experience, the learning curve for robotics wasn't that steep. I mean, I guess it, it depends on, on the teacher as well. I think I had a good teacher who was sitting here uh, when, I was, when I was getting introduced to uh, robotics. I think some of it depends on that. You know, again, like I was introduced to it during my fellowship. Uh, and, and I, I learned, uh, you know, tips and tricks for people who, for from Dr. Lieberman, who's been using it for a while, and who kind of pioneered some of it. Uh, I think for someone who uh, is kind of just taking it up uh, for the first time, uh, there probably is a bit of a learning curve because there are a lot of uh, kind of little tricks and, and important you know, things you have to pay attention to so to make sure that the robot is acting safely. Uh, and that is a key point, you know, a, a little, a few millimeters here and there, just uh, depending on even how much pressure you put on things can make a big difference. So I think uh, there definitely probably is a learning curve. I think the best way is, is to maybe spend a few cases with someone who is very, who has done a lot of these cases and then, and then start on your own. Well, but probably Dr. Not... Lieberman can say a bit more on that. Well, you know, all roads sort of go to, go to easy. I don't know. How does, how, how'd that happen? I, I don't know. I just in the right place at the right time, I guess. But um, I, I maintain that I'm still on my learning curve. It, it's been a 30 year learning curve since I graduated from from my residency at this point. And um, every day you learn one new thing and every case you learn one thing. And we're, we're all still on our learning curve. Uh, but uh, Dr. Gums, Jeff Gums, uh, suggestions are, are spot on. Uh, do what you can do simply, safely first, and then build. And, and you go from there. You know, I, I got my first VW microbus when I was 19 years old, stick shift. I could, after a while, I could tell everything going on with that car just by uh -huh. feeling it, that ha haptic feedback. Well, anyway, gentlemen, uh, we this is all being recorded as you know we're going to break this up into you know consumable chunks and it will live on our otw youtube page and i suspect we'll have many thousand people will be looking at our our handsome faces except for zisha and can't see but that's okay <laughs> it'll be a voice coming out of the dark and uh it'll make it more mysterious and interesting well thank you for putting this all together uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a pleasure as always all right. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank Happy you, my brother. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night, everybody. Thank Take you. care. Good seeing you all.